Now, sometimes the bargaining negotiation will result in a deadlock. So if that happens, what are the courses of action that can be taken by the parties? Well, first, any party can bring the matter to the NCMB for conciliation and mediation, or they can submit the matter for arbitration, or declare a strike or lockout. Uh, in most instances, it is a strike that is prepared by unions. So if there is a deadlock, what would be the legal effect? Well, if the negotiations resulted in a deadlock and the matter has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of a strike or lockout, the majority representation of the certified bargaining agent cannot be challenged by any union through a petition for certification election. That is what we call the deadlock bar rule, which says that no petition for certification election can be filed or entertained when the CBA negotiations that resulted in a deadlock has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of strike or lockout. The case of Nakusip versus Trano is illustrative. In this case, the CBA between the union and uh, the company resulted in a deadlock after which they submitted the deadlock to compulsory arbitration. One month after the deadlock was submitted for compulsory arbitration, a new union filed a petition for certification election. Although the bargaining agent was certified as such, it had been unable to conclude a CBA despite the lapse of one year. Can the petition for certification election prosper? The Supreme Court ruled that the petition cannot prosper because it was filed at a time when the bargaining deadlock was already submitted for arbitration. Under the deadlock bar principle, no petition for certification election can be entertained if a bargaining deadlock has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of a strike or lockout. Now, if the parties have agreed on the terms of the CBA, the union officers and the representatives of management will sign the CBA. The signed CBA must be posted for five days in at least two conspicuous places in the establishment. This is a mandatory requirement, the purpose of which is to inform the covered employees about the terms and conditions of the CBA. It is also necessary that the CBA must be ratified. That means that after the five-day posting, the CBA should be submitted to the employees covered by the bargaining unit for ratification. Again, this is a mandatory requirement. And why is ratification necessary? Well, ratification is necessary because the CBA was entered into by a union acting as agent of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. And the CBA will be deemed ratified if the majority of the employees covered by the bargaining unit approve it. After ratification, the CBA should be submitted to the Department of Labor for registration. What is the legal effect of registration? A duly registered CBA will bar any union from challenging the majority representation of the bargaining agent. The majority representation of the certified bargaining agent can be challenged only during the freedom period, which is the 60-day period prior to the expiry of the five-year term of the contract. That is what we call the contract bar rule. And what does the contract bar rule say? The contract bar rule says that if there is a duly registered CBA, a petition for certification election cannot be filed or entertained except during the 60-day freedom period. In order for the contract bar rule to be operative, the CBA must be duly registered. No, tandaan nyo si Julie, ha? si Julie, magandang kapitbahay dyan. Eh. The CBA must be duly registered. In short, only a duly registered CBA can bar a petition for certification election. A CBA is duly registered if all the requisites for registration have been complied with. So, if the parties were able to register the CBA without complying with any of the requirements for registration, the CBA is not a duly registered CBA. Therefore, it will not bar any union from filing a petition for certification election. What would be an example of registered CBA that are not duly registered? One would be a CBA that was registered without complying with the posting requirement. Hindi nila pinos, basta diretso nilang ratification. Na-post, na-register nila. 
Uh, although registered, the CBA will not be considered as a duly registered CBA. Another example would be a registered CBA that was entered into prior to the freedom period. Another example of uh, a CBA that are not duly registered is a CBA that was entered into with a union that was merely accorded voluntary recognition. If a CBA was registered but not duly registered, it will not bar any union from filing a petition for certification election. In short, the contract bar rule will not apply. Does it mean that uh, a CBA which was not registered is invalid? The answer is no. An unregistered CBA is still valid and binding between the parties. The only effect of an unregistered CBA is that it will not bar the filing of a petition for certification election by another union. Let us now go to the term of a CBA. Well, the term of a CBA, insofar as the representation aspect is concerned, is five years, reckoned from the date of its effectivity. So during the five-year period, no union can challenge the majority representation of the incumbent bargaining agent, except during the freedom period. So can the CBA be renegotiated within the five-year period? Well, the answer is yes. The parties can renegotiate the agreement not later than three years, not later than three years after its execution. After the three-year period, parties can negotiate for a new CBA only during the freedom period. What would be the effectivity of the renegotiated CBA? There are three situations that you should consider. If the parties were able to come to an agreement within six months from the expiry of the third year of the CBA, the effectivity of the new CBA shall retroact to the day immediately following the expiry of the third year. Second situation, if the agreement was arrived at after six months from expiry of the third year, the parties are given the discretion to fix the effectivity thereof. But if the negotiations resulted in a deadlock and the matter was submitted to arbitration, the effectivity shall be the date when the arbitrator's decision became final. In the absence of a new CBA, the terms and conditions of the existing agreement remain until a new agreement is reached. So this brings us to the question of can the parties negotiate a CBA during the freedom period? The answer is yes, they may negotiate for a new CBA during the period. But if a new union files a petition for certification election, then the negotiation must be suspended. Suppose the petition was filed on the 60th day, but the incumbent uh, bargaining agent have already agreed on the terms of the new CBA. Should a certification election be ordered? The answer is yes. A certification election should still be ordered considering that the petition was timely filed. Now, suppose the incumbent bargaining agent lost in the certification election. What will happen to the CBA that it entered into with the employer? It will depend on the following circumstances. First, if the new CBA has not yet been ratified, the new bargaining agent may either submit the agreement for ratification or it can disregard the agreement in its entirety and negotiate for another one. But if the new CBA has already been ratified, the new bargaining agent must respect the agreement under the substitutionary doctrine. And what is the substitutionary doctrine about? Well, the, under the substitutionary doctrine, the employees cannot revoke a validly executed CBA by the simple expedient of uh, changing their bargaining agent, especially so when the CBA was already ratified by the employees themselves. The new bargaining agent must respect the CBA. So, if the freedom period expires without a petition for certification election being filed by any union, the employer is still bound to recognize the majority representation of the incumbent bargaining agent. The CBA applies to and is binding on all employees covered by the bargaining unit, whether union members or not. The minutes, huh, the minutes of the CBA negotiations do not form part of the CBA. The minutes merely reflect the proceedings and discussion. Nothing is considered final until the parties have reached an agreement.
For example, if during the negotiations, the management promised to continue with the practice of granting across-the-board salary increases ordered by the government, such promise can only be demandable if incorporated in the CBA. Let us now move to check off. Uh, if you have seen a CBA, uh, palagi yan, mayroong provision dyan on check off. Now, what exactly is uh, check off? Well, check off is the process by which the employer, on agreement with the bargaining agent or on prior authorization from the employee, deducts union dues, agency fees, and other special assessments from their wages and remits them directly to the Union. Now, to be valid, check off of union dues or special assessments, attorney's fees, and other extraordinary fees must be supported by an individual written check off authorization signed by the employee and specific as to the amount, purpose, and beneficiary of the deduction. But there are certain situations where individual check off authorization is not required. First is check off of agency fees from non-union members covered by the bargaining unit who accept the benefits under the CBA. The second situation is check off of reasonable fees to finance mandatory activities under the labor code. And these mandatory activities uh, refer to uh, labor relations seminar, labor education activities. Can the employees revoke their check of authorization? The answer is Yes, they can. But the revocation need not be done individually. It can be done collectively. Because there is nothing in the law which requires revocation of check of authorization to be in individual form. How do you distinguish union dues from agency fees? Union dues are assessments made against union members. Agency fees are assessments made against non-union members covered by the bargaining unit who accept the benefits under the CBA. Another distinction is that union dues cannot be checked off without individual written check of authorization, whereas agency fees may be checked off without individual authorization. Can the parties suspend their CBA? And the answer is yes, because the right to free collective bargaining includes the right to suspend it, but the decision to suspend must be approved by the majority of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. In the case of Rivera versus Spirito, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the 10-year suspension of the CBA.